Howdy everyone, my name is Nick with Helio. Today's video is going to be about the US regulatory process for spray drones. It's going to be a pretty long video today. We're going to go through the whole process. Just going to start off with a quick summary and then kind of dive into each step along the way. There should be tags in the video if you have questions about one section in particular, just kind of jump over to that section and you know, should find what you need. Uh, we're going to talk about over 55 and under 55 pounds, just everything that we're going to need to get done to spray legally in the United States. This video is being recorded in um, May of 23, so you know, if things change, then some of this might not still be applicable. Um, but it's all been the same for years and years, so I wouldn't expect it to change very much. Hopefully, but maybe not anytime soon. All right, so you need six things to legally spray um, with a drone here in the U.S. So those six things are your 107 drone pilot license, your state pesticide applicator license, your 44807 exemption waiver, aircraft registration, part 137 aerial applicator certificate, and your class two airman's medical certificate. Now, this last one is for over 55 pounds only. So as far as, you know, getting these things done as efficient as possible, you want to get started with your 137 and your 44807 exemption right away. Now, if you're a Helio customer, you bought the drone from Helio, then we're gonna file that 44807 for you. Um, in most cases, you know, you have to sign some paperwork and kind of allow, to, allow us to file it on your behalf. Not everyone does that, but for most people, this is already done. Um, and then your 137. Now this thing has the longest weight, so you want to do that right away. Um, just kind of in general, from the top down, what all these things are. Um, you know, 107, that's your normal, like any 16 year old can get this license. Pretty easy. Um, you just go in and take a test. Uh, pesticide applicator, if you're in ag at all, you probably already have one of these. Um, a little bit different state by state. We're going to provide some details today about Texas. Um, this one can be kind of tough if you're not into ag, but if you are, it should be a cakewalk. Um, the 44807 exemption waiver. So this is the federal government's approval to use a spray drone. So technically using a spray drone is not legal. Spraying with a drone, especially the ones of the size that we use, um, not legal. So you are requesting an exemption from the current laws by filing this like 100 pages of paperwork. Um, and when they approve it, that then allows you to put that drone onto a 137 license. So this is the same license that the spray planes use. And you're basically using the waiver to put that drone that you've registered onto this license. So that's kind of how the interaction is there. And again, if you're over 55 pounds, you need to get this medical certificate, which is basically like a CDL, you know, test, vision test and a drug test that you gotta do every year um, in order to hold this license. But yeah, so that's kind of the review. Um, We're going to get into these one at a time uh, like I said, it's going to be kind of a long video because I'm going to try to get into some of the more details to make sure everybody is going to be able to do this on their own. Um, so, you know, feel free to skip around to the sections that you're having questions about. All right. So, um, first part here, um, the Part 107 Drone Pilot License. So, we have some links here about you know, general information, how to study for the test. This is the FAA's information. So this is going to be harder to read and just not as good to understand as stuff that the free market provides. So there are um, some online courses. If you just Google 107 test prep, something like that, 
Um, there should be some paid and some free options. There's some YouTube courses, stuff like that, um, just to you know study for this test. Once you have studied well enough, um, I just have a link here of kind of how do I schedule it. Basically, you have to go online and make an account, um, something called the Drone Zone. Make an account, I-A-C-R-A -A account. Take the test, um, schedule it, pass it. It's going to be at like a testing center near you. Generally, like local airports are the ones who give these tests. So this whole process you should be able to finish in, I don't know, like two weeks if you're on top of it. Um, once you've gone and taken your test, you need to go out and fill out this form, 8710-13. Um, I believe this one's online as well. You just basically enter your code from your test and you know submit it and they will mail you a license in the mail. Kind of like a driver's license is what it looks like. Um, yeah, so that's how you get your 107. Um, definitely probably one of the easiest ones here. Uh, just tons of information online, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it just because this is extremely common. So if you're having trouble at all, I would just spend some time Googling and you will get through this no problem. All right, so next section here. Um, Pesticide applicator license. So I have some information here about Texas. Um, again, probably won't get into too much details on this one because it does vary state by state. Um, so in some states, you need to get an aerial category. So, you know, you get a pesticide applicator license, you're going to want to get the commercial one. Uh, you could get private, but if you're going to go through all this stuff to get licensed, you might as well be legal to spray for other people. I would go ahead and go all the way and get the commercial. Um, just generally requires a little more testing. Um, in each state, you get this pesticide applicator license and you'll get categories on that license, which is just what you're allowed to spray. So you have to take a test for each category. So um, I hold a um, aerial category and row crop category here in Texas myself. Um, I would recommend getting those if not you know some other stuff as well vegetation management is a very common one um, but because this is going to vary state by state I can't provide a whole lot of information generally there's going to be you know an online place you know in Texas it's here this e-apply licensing tda.gov you'll probably have something very similar just look it up and kind of click through the website um, you're going to have to probably have recurring certifications, you know, every year, CEUs, to keep your license. Um, I think it's maybe a couple of hundred bucks, I think is what Texas is, was. This also was similar to the 107, just a test, you know, go and schedule a test at the testing center. Um, if you, you know, got your drone from Helio, you should have access to this PDF here, which has more information that I'm just kind of skimming over. So I would recommend utilizing this PDF. It has all the links of everything you would need for everything we're talking about today. Um, but yeah, so if you're in Texas, you can follow this. Otherwise, it's it's going to be pretty similar. Just study, go take a test. Um, we have some study information here for the aerial. Um, this one is pretty good. Um, but yeah, so not a whole lot of help on that pesticide applicator just because it's so different in every state. Um, there is some, you know, reciprocity between states. You'd have to look that up. I think Texas has reciprocity with a few states around. Um, so depending on where you want to operate, you'll want to find that out. All right, so next section here, the 44807 exemption waiver. This is, like I was saying before, a just big pile of paperwork that you have to file to the federal government and this is what allows you to add a drone to a 137 license. Like I was saying before, um, you know, Helio files these on behalf of our customers if you sign one of those DocuSign agreements that allows us to do that. If you don't have us do that, you're probably going to need a lawyer to do this because it is a lot of paperwork, like I said, hundreds of pages, a lot of laws involved. 
you're probably going to want us to do this for you. This paperwork essentially sets the terms by which you are allowed to operate. So, you know, they give you the rules based off of how this paperwork is filed. And those rules are going to dictate like how far away you have to stay from things, how fast you can go, how high you can fly, stuff like that. So we're going to talk about the normal exemptions that Helio gets for customers and kind of what the future looks like for the under 55 pound drones and the over 55 pound drones. So again, you probably just want to let us file these for you and then you'll kind of get the approvals that we're talking about here. Now, these filings usually take about three to four months for the FAA to get back. If you ask for more complicated stuff than what's listed here, it can take longer, you know, on the term of more like a year or even more sometimes. Um, but if you're just doing this kind of more basic stuff that we have listed here, usually three to four months from filing, which you need to be aware of. You know, if you're buying a drone and you want to operate legally, then you need to be planning ahead and making sure that you've purchased your drone in time and that you've gotten all this stuff filed in time. So first one is the Ag-10. So that's our only model that's under 55 pounds. And everything that we're going to talk about here basically applies to any waiver that's approved for spray drones. This is kind of the industry standard right now. So under 55 pound drones, usually they go through a little faster, you know, sometimes two to three months instead of three to four. Um, once it goes through, you are not required to have a visual observer and there is no minimum distance from non-participating entities. So we're talking about like cars, buildings, stuff like that. You can't fly over top of them, but there isn't like some extra requirement to be particularly far away. Now, just to kind of back up a bit, what's a visual observer? You know, what's a non-participating entity? When you look at the other drones that are over 55 pounds, you have a requirement to have other people there. So under 55 pounds, you just have one person and one drone. That's it. You can, you know, you can fly right up to a fence line, something like that, close to a road, all legal. So Filio files your waivers for you, or your exemptions for under 55 pounds. That's what you're going to get. You don't get to fly at night, but you can do you know, one person, one drone, kind of right up close to a road. So now over 55 pounds. This is where the FAA starts to make things more complicated. Um, they basically treat anything over 55 pounds all the same. So up to like 3,000 pounds. Uh, it's all kind of in one big category for them. So you're talking the AG-16, the AG-30, the AG-72. So, you know, X-16, that's what, four and a half gallons up to the 72, which is what, 18 or 20, um, all have this same approval, you know, same restrictions when they get approved. Um, right off the bat, you know, we'll take a little bit longer, probably three or four months, um, and they have these extra requirements. First one is filing NOTAMs. So these are basically, it's called a notice to airmen. Um, this and this all these things I'm listing they come as a requirement on the approved waiver so these notice to airmen um, you're supposed to file 72 to 48 hours before each flight sometimes they put 72 to 24 so it just depends um, basically you have to call a hotline and um, there is an online portal but most people can't seem to get it to work so most people end up just calling a hotline saying hey I'm gonna fly in this area for you know, a couple of days. Basically, depending on who you get on the phone, some people will let you file for, hey, I'm gonna be here all week, and they'll just put out, uh, you know, one of these notice to airmen for a whole week. A lot of them won't let you do that. They'll let you kind of do one day at a time. Um, big pain, but I mean, basically this just puts little circles on the map, so manned aviation can know that there is a big drone flying in this area you know, at a certain height. So um, next requirement, all pilots must have a visual observer for the flight. So that means effectively two people per drone. So 
doesn't matter if it's an Ag-16 all the way up to a 72, you have two people for each drone. Now, there are some regulations. It's looking like this is going to change very soon, um, allowing you know multiple drones and stuff like this. But as of right now, two people per drone. Um, you know that can make things very difficult, which is kind of pushes more people to go for the bigger drones if they're going legal. Because if you need to have two people per drone, you might as well get the one that has 20 gallons as opposed to the one that has four and a half. Um, next requirement, the uh, distance requirement. So initially, uh, the FAA gave us 500 feet from non-participating entities. So roadways, waterways, and structures. Does not mean the road itself, it means cars on the road. So if there's no cars on the road, it doesn't matter. But you need to somehow be confirmed that there are no cars on the road and structures, so people's houses, stuff like that. Um, you can go within you know, certain distances if you ask permission. And a fence counts as a structure. So this means you know, 100 feet of your neighbor's fence. Now, like I was saying a moment ago, this used to be 500 feet, but that distance got reduced. But if you're flying between 500 and 100 feet, you have extra restrictions. I believe you have to be under 20 feet off the ground and 15 miles an hour if you're between that 500 and 100. But this is important. You know, if you maybe have a neighbor that you don't get along with or something like that, they're not going to give you permission to fly within 100 feet of their fence. Um, I would say a lot of these maybe don't get followed, but you know, those are the rules for over 55 pounds. All right, so that's the main difference. Um, you know, these advanced operations waivers, they are starting to get approvals. I think um, a lot of more people may be getting them pretty soon, but as of right now, this is what you can expect as far as legal approvals with the over 55 pound drones for the 44807. And like I was saying, this 44807 sets the terms from the federal government by which that you can operate. You apply for this, and then you attach this to your 137, which is the actual license that you're going to use to spray with. All right, so that's it for the 44807. Again, just probably just going to want to get Helio to file this for you. All right, so next one, registering your aircraft. Next section here. So... Uh, Registering your aircraft with the FAA is going to, again, be different if you're under 55 pounds versus over 55 pounds. So, under 55 pounds, you can use this online link here. So, dronezone.com. Um, if you have a um, 110 versus a 210, then it's going to be a little bit different. If you have a 110, you do not have standard remote ID. If you have a 210, you do have standard remote ID. So whenever you're filling this thing in, you're gonna to wanna to select from the drop-down standard remote ID, you know, if you have 210. Important thing to note, standard remote ID, when it says, what's your remote ID serial number? So it's not just your normal serial number, it's your remote ID serial number. You need to add this number 17906 to the front of your serial number. That is Helio's manufacturer code for our standard remote ID devices. So you just have to slap that on on the front. If you don't do this, it's not gonna let you register because it's gonna say that this remote ID number doesn't exist. So you slap that number on on the front and all of those drones are in the FAA systems. You know, Helio has added them in. So just go through this, go on that online. You probably gotta make an account, but that is how you register under 55 pounds pretty easy compared to the over 55 pounds. So over 55 pounds is more of a pain. There are two ways to do it. You can go online, especially if you just Google, how do I register a drone over 55 pounds? They do have an online way to do it. Now, for whatever reason, the online process, it takes like a year, more than a year, 14 months, something like that. You go and submit it online and it says, your drone is in line for review. We will get back to you in, you know, sometime in 2024, you know, like mid to late 2024, it's crazy. 
Um, so I wouldn't really recommend that. A lot of people see it, they think it's gonna be faster. It's not gonna be faster. I would recommend you register using the paper, just paper forms, um, basically the same as you would register a Cessna or something like that. Um, I'm going to pull up some sample forms here for a 72. Um, so here we go, example registration files. So again, if you're a Helio customer, I'm gonna jump up really quick here to jump back down. Um, whenever you purchase a drone in that flash drive that has all the information or we email this to you as well, when we receive a deposit, there's a folder in there called US Regulation Files Kit. Now, in there, you are going to find basically, you know, this right here, this um, example 137 files, example aircraft registration files, and example compliance records. So we try and in an effort to make this easy for everybody, um, we give blank forms and example forms for everything that we can. So we're gonna jump back down here and start looking at some of our example forms for the aircraft registration. Because these forms can be confusing and if you get them wrong at all, then the FAA will just go ahead and kick that back. So we're doing a aircraft registration over 55 pounds. You need two things. So you need your form 8050-1. So this is the actual registration form. And then you also need this affidavit of ownership, which needs to be notarized. So we're gonna take a look through each of these forms here and just kind of give you some tips, talk about the process. Big recommendation right off the bat, use these example forms. They will make things quite a bit easier. You can just kind of fill in, for the most part, what it's talking about here. All right, so um, just starting at the top, this is the actual registration application. So it asks for an end number, just leave it blank. Um, manufacturer model, you know, I have the example here for the 72, but we have examples for all of them. So you put your serial number, you know, you put, if you're an individual, government, you know, corporation, etc. cetera, um, put your company name, not your individual name here. It says name of applicant, but if you put, you know, a company, because you want to register to the company, which is generally how we would recommend doing it, uh, so other people can use it um, at the company, put your company name here. Do not put your individual name, or they will very likely send it back. Phone number, address, easy enough, address if it's a P.O. box. Um, even if it is a company, you're going to want to put citizen here, you know, if you're a citizen, put citizen. And then down here, you've got your signature, your name, and your title. So if you're doing company, you're going to want to put a title that makes the FAA believe that you can be a signatory for the company. So ideally, this is the owner of the company signing this and they can just put owner, you know, company name or maybe general manager or something like that. But if you just put like technician or something, because that, you know, you're just a technician at the company, they're probably going to send that back. They're going to say you can't register an aircraft on behalf of this company because I don't think you can legally sign on behalf of the company and it will get sent back. So I'm going to fill that in. And then on the next page, you just fill in, you know, serial number and drone model. So that's it, just these two pages. Um, right here, kind of on that first page, we have just the address of where to send it. So, you know, USPS, which is normal mail, just send it there. Um, aircraft registration branch, you want to send it with a check for $5 payable to the Federal Aviation Administration. You're going to want to include your invoice or your terms and conditions of sale document, just as evidence that you purchased the aircraft. You want to put that in the envelope with this form, obviously not this one, you know, you need to fill out the blank one, along with this affidavit of ownership. So three things, four things, check the actual registration application, affidavit of ownership, and the invoice or terms and conditions of sale agreement. All of that in an envelope, mail to the FAA. And then it should take if you do this paper method, you're looking at a month, which is, I mean, it's great compared to a year when you're looking at the online one. Don't ask me why that is. It just, 
is how it is for now, at least. So this is certainly the way you want to go. All right. I apologize for doing this, but we have our first edit um, of the video here. FA doesn't change this stuff too much, but they recently changed this affidavit of ownership form um, to include the remote ID stuff. So I am popping this in here, just at the just that portion where we're going through this form. The last 30 seconds, this form might have looked a little bit different. Kind of wanted to leave that part in. So we're just going to go through this, kind of look at the changes here. Um, you know, from from what it was, I don't know, a few months ago. So this is the affidavit of ownership form. Uh, just start from the top. We've got our end number. You want to leave this part blank um, unless you're picking an end number, which is a whole separate process that I'm not going to walk you through. So just go ahead and leave it blank. They're going to pick a number for you. Um, class, you're going to want to pick Rotorcraft. Uh, manufacturer, Helio, of course. Model, AG272. Again, we're just going through the 72 on this one. So if you, know, you have this files kit from Helio, if you open up this file, it's going to have the information, including like the weight and all the stuff for your aircraft. So for this one, 272. Um, serial number here, if it is a two series drone, so, so 272, 216, 230, you're going to hit standard remote ID. And that standard remote ID serial number is just going to be 17906, this number right here followed by your actual serial number. So the drone has a six digit serial number that's on the side of the aircraft, it's on the radio, it's on the like handheld RC, um, six digits. But for the standard remote ID, just like for the Ag-10, you need to put this 17906 to the front. This is Helio's manufacturer code, it lets the FAA know that it's one of Helio's serial numbers. Now, if this is not a two series drone, so for whatever reason you got an older drone, you know, 116, 130 would be the two that this would apply to, you're gonna have to check this box because you do not have remote ID. Only the two series drones have remote ID. So if you're one series, you just hit manufacturer and type in your normal serial number. You don't add any of this. Two series, you're going standard remote ID and you're adding this 17906 to the front. All right, so next engine type, we're gonna to wanna to go electric. Uh, number of engines, eight, takeoff weight, 400 pounds. Again, 16 and 30s, this is gonna be different. This is what you put for the 72. Um, so next part, uh, the certification of it. So you're gonna to wanna to mark X by number one here, assuming you purchased it from us and not used. Um, put in your purchase date, Helio, Richmond, Texas, USA. Um, Again, it says right here, um, manufacturer bill of sale. If you got it, you're gonna to wanna to put attached. If you don't, not available. You should have it, you should include it. Um, next here, uh, bottom part. So you've got um, just the signing. So you've got owner's name. If you put the company name here, um, really just wherever you put here, obviously if you're an individual, you put the individual, but if you're registering for a company, you put the company name. Whatever you put on that other one, you put right here. So company name here has to match that registration application. Owner signature, so you're gonna sign here. You're gonna put your name here and then you're gonna put your job title. Again, it has to match what's on your registration application here. And then lastly, it needs to get notarized. Wait to sign it until you're in front of the notary. I mean, your notary might let you get away with it, but you're supposed to sign in front of them. And then once you're done, we will just go ahead and put all that together and mail it in. All right, so that is our registering an aircraft over 55 pounds. It's a little complicated. Certainly it would be better to just do it online. A lot of people are tempted to do it online. I would not do it because then this will very quickly take a very, very long time. So. That is registering aircraft over and under 55 pounds. All right, next, this is the big one. Uh, this is kind of what brings it all together. This is the 137 uh, certificate. 
Again, this is the same thing that the spray planes use. Uh, this is the actual license. I mean, you have that 107 license, which is just to basically for them to know that you know the drone rules. This is the sprayer, like an airplane sprayer certificate. Same thing that the planes use, same thing that the helicopters use. So um, this is broken down into five phases, um, pre-application phase, formal application phase, document compliance, demonstration, and certification. So it is very, very important to complete phase one and phase two as soon as possible. The 137 is, generally speaking, the longest of the entire regulatory process. This can take as long as a year, sometimes even longer. There is a national wait list of these certificates that the FAA just does in order of receiving them. As far as I'm aware, as of right now in May 2023, I think the line, like the, the line to do this is 600 people, something like that. And the FAA, you know, they just do one at a time based off who's at the front of the line. Now, we've seen in some states that the local FAA guys are doing the people in their area first, which I think is great. It makes the whole thing happen a lot faster, but it's not happening all over the place. So you can't really bet on this happening very quickly. So you want to get into that wait list as soon as possible and start that you know ticker going. So the big question is, how do you get into the wait list? How you get in the wait list is by getting through phase one and phase two. Now, phase one, phase two, it sounds like a big whole thing. It's not, it is submitting two pieces of paper, a LOI and a form, form 8710-3. Now, similar to the registration, we're providing example documents and blank documents for you to just fill in. So we're gonna go through those. Um, but first, just really need to reiterate, you wanna do this right away. It's super easy. It can take about half an hour to get this stuff done. There's no money involved. You just mail these forms to your local FAA office. All of these 137 certificates are managed through your local, what's called an FSDO. So just a local FAA office. So the first thing you wanna do is you need to find out who is your FSDO, who is your local FAA office. So if you click this link, it will open up this web page here for your flight standards district office lookup tool. So if we just go to say Texas here for Helios, we'd search and we've got four of these in Texas. Usually there's just one or two. You basically can, I mean, you're just gonna kind of guess whichever one's closest to you. If you want, they have service areas which just list, you know, which counties I think belong for which office. But you're gonna look up using this tool here on that on that website which one belongs to you, and you're gonna get this address. So now we have that address. We are going to mail our paperwork to that address. So two things we need to mail for phase one, phase two. Phase one is just one form. Phase two is the other form. You can mail them together immediately. You don't need to mail one and then wait and mail the other. So we're going to go here and open up our example 137 application files. And again, I'm going to our US regulation files kit here. And last time we were looking at those aircraft registration files, now we're looking at the example 137 application files. So we go to example forms. We have two things here. Um, there's your LOI and your form. Uh, what was this 8710-3? Let me just scroll back down to do, do. yeah 87 10-3 all right so super easy we're gonna start with the LOI um, basically you just put on a piece of paper you know if you've got some letterhead put some letterhead on there so it looks official address it to your FISDO that we just looked up your address for and you just say exactly this. This is to notify the FAA that we intend to become a 137 operator. Say we plan to begin operations on whatever. Even though we're not expecting this to happen for a year probably, maybe eight months, 
put whatever date that you would like to operate. So don't put today, don't put tomorrow. You know, we want to be reasonable as if the government were to hold up their end of the deal. Because I think technically they're supposed to do this within three months, but they never do. Just put some date, you know, start of the summer. I'd like to operate at the start of summer. Just put when you would like to operate. They're going to ignore this date. It really doesn't matter, but you want to put something realistic here. Um, and then you just fill this in. Blah, 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 involve the operation of one of whatever drone you own. Even if you bought five drones, you know, five of these AG-72s or something like that, you want to just put one. Um, you know, even if you have three different models of drone, you just want to pick one drone, generally the smallest one, one of them, and you put it on there. Reason being, getting the license requires all these inspections and stuff. Once you have the license, it's very easy to add aircraft, but it adds some complexity having three or four aircraft right off the bat because they're going to be asking you, well, okay, where's your waivers for, you know, having three aircraft in the air at a time and all this, you know, things are going to get a lot more complex. They're going to ask you a lot more questions. If you just put this application as simple as possible, you get the license through. Once you have it, this is a lifetime license. You can easily add drones and add, you know, exemptions and stuff like that later on. So you just say, I want to fly one drone. You put it on there, nice and simple. Now, that's your LOI, so that's phase one. We're, you know, we just typed up that three sentences, super easy. Phase two is this form 8710-3. So similar to the other ones, we just put our stuff in blue here. Um, we want to do commercial. You can put private, but the whole process is exactly the same. If you do commercial versus private. So it really does you no good to go through all of this and put private and only allow yourself to operate you know on your own property when you could have been able to spray for other people and it would have made the pro it makes the process no easier to do private so you might as well do commercial um, economic poisons you're going to want to do original um, name and address so you know business name business address your phone number it's going to say you know operation space airport so since you have a drone you don't need to have an airport your airport is also your business address so you know put your business address there and phone number um, so this you've got operating as individual or corporation or partnerships put whatever applies um, name of chief supervisor so put your name here basically there is going to be one person who is responsible for everything when it comes to this license. You know, like I said, this 137 brings it all together. And there's going to be one person at your company that is the person that holds the 107, has the chemical license, and, you know, just generally the person who manages all this stuff. You're probably going to want them to be the chief supervisor. That does not mean they're the only person who can fly these drones. The chief supervisor can then, down the line, certify other people within your organization to operate under your certificate. So people that work for you, the chief supervisor kind of waves their magic wand and trains the person and they have to, you know, record a record of the training and then that person can operate under the supervision of the chief supervisor. So that's how you can have multiple people operating, you know, at one company but you're going to want to pick someone who's going to be the guy, basically, um, at your company. And that's going to be your chief supervisor. When the FAA comes and does their inspection and all that stuff, that person is the person that has to be flying the drone and all that. So let's say you're the company owner. If you're not going to be flying the drone, you may not want this to be you because FAA, I mean, you have to know how to do everything, whoever this person is. And if you're just the owner and you've got someone else flying, then even though you may want your name to be on this stuff, if you don't want to really learn how to use the drone, then you probably don't want to put your name here. All right, so do you currently hold a certificate or a waiver? You're going to want to put no and pending, unless your 44807 has already been approved, which it probably hasn't, hopefully, because you did this right away. Um, if it has, then you can fill this in, but presumably you can just put no and just put pending. That's fine. 
Um, so no pending. Now aircraft to be operated, so whatever drone you're doing, might as well put liquid and solid, even if you didn't buy a solid spreader, it doesn't make any difference. It just allows you to use a spreader if you ever do get one. Number of aircraft, again, just put one, make it less complicated, and registration mark. So, again, hopefully you don't have this yet because you did this 137 right away. This is day one, you should be doing this. You're allowed to put pending here. This is not your serial number. This is the end number that they give you when you register your aircraft. So you're probably gonna to wanna to put pending here and say you already filed your registration and that's okay. If you just put no then, or just leave it blank, then they're gonna ask you what the deal is. You put pending and say that you filed the registration, that is allowed. And then that's pretty much it. Date, uh, title, company, and signature. Second page, you don't do anything. So pretty easy. You can see how between these two pieces of paper, you're gonna write two sentences and you're gonna fill in this super quick form. It does not take very long at all to get phase one and phase two, which is the LOI and form 8710-3 done. There's no writing checks, there's no nothing. The whole process is free. You do those two forms, utilize the blank and example forms that we provide, and then mail them to the address that we put you know that you looked up using this link you get that mailed and that is all it takes to get you into the wait list they should notify you whenever they received your documents they should send you a piece of paper back in the mail saying okay we received it you are now in the wait list you are position 670 or something you know of the the national wait list now one thing to keep in mind when you mail this 8710-3 you should mail three copies of this form 8710-3 it seems silly but there is some special little rule that if they don't get three copies they don't technically have to put you into the wait list until they get three now most visdos they're not going to be like this they'll probably be more reasonable people and they won't do that because they have a scanner um, so it's not a problem, but if for whatever reason you got some enemies at the FISDO or something, they can use that to wait two months and then send, send you back a, a you know, piece of mail that says, oh, we didn't get three copies, you're not on the wait list yet. And all of a sudden you're months behind from what you, where you could have been. So mail three copies, just we're going by the letter of the law here. You mail them three copies of this properly filled out and your LOI, they have to put you in the wait list. So, We've done phase one and two, we're in the wait list and we're waiting, you know, maybe it's been six months or something and okay, now it's our turn. In that six months, you know, hopefully we've gone through and done everything else. You know, day one, we go and get that stuff mailed in and we start that longest waiting period. Now, see, like I said here, Helio is going to file that waiver on your behalf. Um, now that we've gotten that, the long-term stuff kind of rolling. We're going to go get our 107, we're going to get our pesticide applicator, we're going to get our airman's medical, and we're going to do our aircraft registration. Even if you're really taking your time with all this stuff, you know, you should be able to get it done in a few months. And then by the time it's your turn for this 137 inspection, um, you have everything you need. So, okay, six months down the line, we went through, we did all the other stuff. Now the FAA reaches out, they say, hey, it's your turn, um, time to start the document compliance phase. So this is where they will ask you for all of your manuals and all of this other stuff. They're going to ask you for your 107, they're going to ask you to see some insurance, they're going to ask you for your uh, medical certificate, all the stuff that we've talked about that you need to do, they're going to need to see it. You're going to need to send them that waiver. So. You email them copies of all of this stuff, including all of your drone manuals, and they're gonna take probably a week or so and just go through everything and make sure everything looks right. Now, when they ask for manuals, there are two different types of manuals that Helio has that we provide to the purchaser. So one is the actual drones manuals that get updated every quarter or so with just as the product changes, stuff like that, software updates, the actual manuals for how you use the drone. The other manuals are 
the FAA manuals, which is not the same. It has the kind of operating procedures that have been legally approved on your waivers. So this is what you need to send them. You do not, if you send them your normal drone manuals, the ones that we update all the time, it's, they're gonna respond and say, this isn't right, you're missing yada, yada, yada. And then someone at Helio is probably gonna get an email saying, what do I do? Get in front of that now, here is what you do. Um, we talked about this sample files kit. We're going back there again. We already used our aircraft registration. We did our 137 application. Now we have this third one, example applicator compliance records. So that is this right here. When we get to doing this, you know, 137 inspection, this is all the stuff that they're going to need to see. We basically have I mean, these, most of these folders are just empty, but it's just to provide you with some understanding of what they're going to need. So you've got your 107, you know, you've got that scanned and in there, your exemption, your medical certificate, your chemical license. Um, we have a little spreadsheet here that you can use for tracking your, your NOTAMs when you file them. Um, drone registrations, you need to have that there saved. Drone manuals, here is where you will find the FAA version of the manuals. Again, this is in the example applicator compliance records folder, drone manuals. So this is not the same as the normal manuals that you'll be using, hopefully, in reading to learn how to use the drone. This is the FAA version. So this is what you need to send them. Um, we have employee training documentation, insurance, maintenance records, application records. So we've put some spreadsheets in there just for examples of how you should track your applications um, for legal compliance. But this is what the FAA needs to see when we're talking document compliance. You send them all this stuff, you send them those FAA manuals, they're gonna review it when it looks good, which it will. Those manuals have been certified dozens of times uh, by these people, so they're all good to go. They're gonna message, email you and say, hey, let's schedule the demonstration. So the demonstration is pretty much the final step here. They're going to come out to your property, um, your facilities, wherever that is, and they want to see you, I mean, they want to see all these documents in person, and then they want to see you fly the drone, and they're going to give you a exam, basically. So, you know, three sections, the, you know, seeing the drone and the documents, then there's the exam, then there's the flying. So, seeing the drone and documents, I mean, just read through this list here, but they basically just want to see everything that they ask for in the document compliance. You just show them everything, kind of how you're organizing your stuff. Remember that these are your local FAA officials. This is not the federal government. This is your state government entities here. I mean, I guess it's technically the federal government, but they more than anything want to know that you are going to be reasonable and responsible and you are not going to go and cause a lot of problems in their district, which is what they don't want. You know, they want to see that you're organized and you have everything in order. So first part, just kind of showing them your stuff. Next part, there is a written or oral exam. From everything I've seen, it's always been an oral test. Basically, they're going to sit down and ask you some questions directly to make sure that you know your stuff. So there are four sections to this. First section is they're going to ask you questions similar to the 107. So we're talking like silly stuff, you know, how far to stay away from clouds and general stuff like that. If you passed your 107, you should have the answers to this, or you should know. Second one is questions about chemical knowledge. So something along the lines of what's a chemical that you plan on using and what kind of PPE do you need and where do you find that? So if you've passed your state pesticide applicator test and you have your state pesticide applicator, which you would have to by now, these questions are going to be a breeze. You know more about chemicals than these FAA guys do for sure if you have that license. So don't worry about that. Um, third one here, questions about your 44807 approvals. So Helio files those approvals. We just email them back to you whenever they're approved. And you know, it's like a 10, 20 page document that just is your approval and you're going to have to have it saved and you'll have to have shown them by now, you know, during the document compliance, you will have had to have sent it to them. 
on that document, there is probably starting on like the fourth or fifth page, there's a section that says conditions and limitations of operation. Conditions and limitations. And there's either, if it's under 55 pounds, it's like 14 bullets or something like that. If it's over 55 pounds, it's like 25 different bullets. Basically these, like we are talking about before, these are the conditions by which you're allowed to operate according to that exemption. So you need to know what those conditions are and they're gonna ask you questions. You know, if it says you need a VO and a visual observer and under what conditions do you need a visual observer? And you know, we talked about that distance stuff that, you know, 100, 500 feet away, you need to know those rules and this is where you find them. They're gonna ask you questions about that. And then lastly, they're going to ask some questions about your drone in particular from these FAA manuals that you sent them during phase three. So, you know, you sent that stuff over, they're going to ask you some questions about like operating restrictions. If in the manuals it says you can operate in light rain, but not heavy rain or, you know, maximum takeoff weight of your aircraft, stuff like that. So for all of these, I've never seen that these people are out here trying to fail you. Generally, in my experience, they let you have all of your documentation that you showed them. Most people at this point just have a big binder of all this stuff. They let you have that binder out. They want to understand that in the real world, you're going to need to know stuff like this and do you have a reasonable recourse to find this information. It is understood that you might not know like, oh, con what's condition seven out of 23 on your approved exemption, 447? Yeah, maybe you don't have that memorized, but you know what they're talking about. And you can find it really quickly, and you're not, you know, you could look up some of these things, maybe you're not looking up everything, and you're not taking 10 minutes to answer every question because you have to dig through and you're Googling for 10 minutes. They're reasonable people. They want to see that you have the capability to in a reasonable amount of time answer all these questions and you know most of them. So just just understand most of the stuff here. Like I said, most of these guys, reasonable people, they're your local FAA guys. They're not some, you know, faceless, nameless federal government entity. You know, they want they want you to pass because if you don't, they have to come back out and do this again. So even if, you know, let's say you were really horrible for some reason, you didn't study at all, didn't prepare, they're going to leave and probably just have to reschedule this and tell you what to study and come back. So it's not the end of the world. Don't worry, like if you get some of this stuff wrong, that okay, all of this year of work is, is just for nothing. Don't worry about it. All right, so you pass that, that exam, that oral exam, okay, good to go. Last step here, they're gonna to want to do a flight demonstration. So hopefully you've been, even though you don't have the license, maybe you've been flying the drone around with some water, which is fine. Um, you've been spraying some water, they just wanna see you use it. So just, you wanna do a standard auto mission. If you have to follow a NOTAM, if you're checking your airspace or something like that, you wanna go through everything that you have to do normally you want to use your checklist, you go out there, you just do a typical auto mission, you know, general spray mission. It doesn't have to be a whole big thing. It can spray a quarter of an acre in your backyard. So, okay, that's a normal, normal mission. That's the first thing they want to see. Second thing they want to see is they want to see you demonstrate what happens when you lose connectivity to the drone. And what they need to see is that drone returning home. So you want to make sure that lost link um, Failsafe is turned on. If you're using the drone, you'll know what I'm talking about. You wanna make sure that's turned on and the drone's gonna start. So you've done your normal auto mission. It came back, it landed, you sent it back out. You wanna yank that radio from the computer or turn off your remote controller and they wanna see that drone come back and land. So drone comes home, lands, good to go. Okay, so that's the second flight. Third flight, they want to see you take off, fly it with an auto mission do, you just do the same auto mission three times in a row. Third time, you want to take over with the remote controller. They're going to just say, oh, pretend there's an emergency. Take over with the controller, bring it home and land it. So that's what you got to do. Um, you need to know how to do this. You, ideally, you don't want this to be the first time that you've taken over from an auto mission using the controller. So you want to practice. 
But these three things are the three things that they want to see you do. In all reality, this can take half an hour. I mean, this whole process really does not have to take very long if you are prepared. And then that's it. If it goes well, then they will go home and they will write up all the paperwork. And a lot of the time they will come back and have you sign it in person. But then you're good to go. Um, you have this 137. It's a lifetime license. There's no fees involved at any step of the way here to get this. Um, like I said, it kind of brings everything together. Someone does this final certification that you have all of these different things kind of lined up. Um, you know, that you're a responsible guy. And you, from then on, they're supposed to every year come and inspect what you're doing. A lot of the time they don't. Uh, they're supposed to be coming and checking your records. A lot of the time they don't. You may never see these guys again. But now you're licensed. Now you are fully good to go. As long as you keep everything that was required, you keep up to date, then you're good. Um, one last thing about this 137. It does say that there is an um, insurance requirement, usually in those waivers. I think it says that you have to be insured. It does not say what type of insurance so that level of insurance coverage is generally dictated by your state applicator license. For example, in Texas, here's just a quote of the Texas requirements. You're gonna to wanna to just do whatever your state pesticide insurance requirements are, and that's it. Yeah, whenever they're talking about, FAA is saying, hey, what insurance do you have? They're not looking for anything specific, just whatever you're required to have by your Department of Agriculture, just show them that, they're gonna be good to go. All right, so that's the 137. That's the big one. Um, hopefully that should give you a good understanding of kind of what is required and kind of how all that stuff comes together. Now, lastly, we have our class two Airman's Medical Certificate. Probably could have went over this one first. Um, class two Airman's Medical, like I was saying at the intro, is kind of like a CDL you just take a vision test, take a drug test, just a quick physical. It's required for um, any of the over 55 pound drones. They just give you a little certificate. Um, basically to go and get this, you have to go to this website, complete a form, you make like a little login. You go, I think not all doctors will do it, but it's like an av aviation medical examiner. They have a list of people that are certified to do it. You go and do it, probably will be like a hundred bucks, a couple hundred bucks, depending on the doctor. Um, and then they'll just give you a little form on the spot. Um, so pretty simple. Um, just kind of follow the links and that should show you where to go. Um, but yeah, that is it. Uh, thank you for watching. Um, this has just been a you know, general view. Hopefully this wasn't too long. And if you watched the whole thing, awesome. You should be... Um, good to go. Just utilize this U.S. regulations document. Um, it is going to continue to get updated. Use it as much as you can. Use the example files um, as much as you can. You want to try to minimize your mistakes, you know, double check everything just to make sure you don't have delays because so much of it is done in paper. So just have to mail things out causes tons of slowdowns if you make any clerical mistakes. So double check everything. Um, and yeah, good luck. Thank you again for watching.